also here. Would they shut down the bar already? <laughs> no, actually, I was I was kind of hoping that going last, I would get to this point and I would be able to make some graceful hand gestures and say what they said. <laughs> um, but maybe there's one more story. Um, so I'm gonna. How are we doing for time? Great. Okay. Good. So um, I probably have to start this by saying. I'm going, to start, I'm going to start by saying that I am a southerner who went west. Um, I arrived out here in 1980 to go to grad school and I never really left. Uh, and then about 15 years ago, I ended up heading even further west, research-wise, into that big, wet, splashy place west of the west that we've been hearing about called the Pacific. And working in Fiji for about a decade introduced me to yet another trove of regional identity in which a romanticized narrative of a larger-than-life historical past plays out against a somewhat grittier and much more deeply contested contemporary legacy of colonialism and industrialization and globalization. So by now, um, I have accumulated a small but pretty powerful comparative collection. Um, I don't have a flyer for mine now, but I'll get one. Yeah. Um, that, that lets us look at this concept of regional identities. And then I edited my paper down. I took out the part where I had the nice list of comparisons. Maybe we can talk about that afterwards. But I'm going to move on to get to my focus for talking about what the West is. Um, we've heard a great deal about the nuances of all of these definitions of the West from the other panelists already, so I'm not going to belabor that. In particular, we've spent a lot of time talking about the role of archaeology in constructing and critiquing Western narratives, Western stories, um, about the links between the past and the present in that region. And I'd like to slight, take a slightly different tack. I'm going to tack back in a direction sort of towards Kelly's, but with a bit of a twist, because I want to talk some more about the West as a place, um, not a geographical place per se, and not an imaginary place either, but sort of threading the needle on those. The West as a place that people make and remake over and over and over again. I want to talk about place making in the present, in the West. Placemaking is one of those inherent and ongoing processes by which human beings connect themselves to each other, to time, past, present, and future, and to some bounded sense of existence. As archaeologists, we study uh, this place called the West and its various pasts, to be sure. But doing archaeology in the West is also part of the same process of present-day placemaking in the West. As it is everywhere else that we do archaeology, it's not that the West is special in that regard, but in particular, it has a pretty significant power in the West, and I think you've heard versions of this from everybody who spoke tonight. From the moment that we get out those magic crayons of ours and draw that most abstracted of intellectual landscapes, the site boundary, until uh, to our participation in designating local or state historic sites, landmarks, and national register properties, to our declaring of locations to be significant or not, or to have integrity or not, we participate directly in today's Western placemaking, not just Western storytelling. And we do so with claims of intellectual and legal authority that give our decisions considerable weight in that placemaking process. Although sometimes, frankly, at some of those ER uh, meetings, it doesn't seem like it does it count. No. no. Yeah, I know. I'm thinking positive here. So one of the questions I find myself asking myself, coming back to my own work again and again, is what kinds of places are we making here? And are we making boundaries or peripheries or edges, right? What kinds of places, 
are archaeologists making in this larger place we call the West? Um, that proverbial question number two is tricky. We all sort of, you know, it's like, boundaries? Okay, boundaries. Um, I have to say that my experience with this as someone who came West from another place that is very much uh, described by its regional identity um, was kind of a bit like that old, if a tree falls in the forest sort of proposition. If you stop seeing something as an edge, can you still fall off it occasionally? Um, my, my experience would be the answer to that is yes, uh, but you do so less and less. And over the past um, 35 years of working in the West and in the Pacific, I have to say that on, on some, uh, my dominant experience has been um, to have things I thought were edges disappear over time. Uh, things like the boundary between prehistory and history that we just heard Kelly talk about, for example. Um, the boundary between the past and the present, which is what mythic uh, stories about the past um, tend to make you look at very, very carefully and then make some very hard decisions about whether you really want to draw that line or not. But saying that, I, I want to focus, I want to tell one last story tonight about an edge that I hadn't expected to see uh, as a southerner as a, and as an easterner when I came west. And it is one that I have had um, drawn very sharply for me over the past 12 years of participating in the Teaching American History Grant program uh, out here in California. How many veterans of Teaching American History Grant programs do we have in the audience out there? One or two or three? Yeah, a few, right? All right, so I want to tell you about ours. Um, in a lot of ways, this brings me back to this idea of placemaking that I mentioned earlier and to an idea or the idea of engaging with the people who actually live in the West today and with their perceptions of the region and how it is connected to the rest of the nation and to broader global realities. It's one thing for people like us to say that it's a world system and everything's connected. It's another thing to, to be an archaeologist, being a placemaker in this place to interact with the people who live here and listen to how they feel about it. Um, and that's what this experience in particular taught me. And as it turns out, archaeology had something vital to contribute here. But at least in my experience, this turned out to be much less about the sites that we define and protect and study that are so important to us, and much more about the perspectives that we actually bring to the table especially as historical archaeologists, steeped in an intellectual tradition that sees the, at least the last 500 years in particular as a sweep of vast historical processes that nonetheless take place in small, localized settings, households, neighborhoods, and communities. So probably the clearest sense of this, of how the West is perceived at least by some of its own residents as a periphery, came to me um, while working in this Teaching American History Grant. We were an interdisciplinary team of historians, education specialists, and one itinerant archaeologist. And we worked with roughly 250 fourth and fifth grade teachers in 10 different school districts in and around the northern San Francisco Bay Area. We worked together with cohorts of between 30 and 40 teachers at a time across a three-year program that culminated in a 10-day trip to Boston, Philadelphia, and Plymouth Plantation uh, during each third summer. Now in California, you need to know that the fifth grade U.S. history curriculum begins with an extremely generalized and essentially ahistorical and loosely regional um, Native America unit and ends with pre-Civil War quote-unquote Western expansion by the new nation of the United States, although nearly every teacher that we worked with confessed that they never actually got to that part of the course. So they never got to teach about the part of the, the region that they lived in as part of American history. Um, one of our main goals with this whole program, with the curriculum, 
um, was to shift the focus from the textbook style approach to the key events, you know, the one damn thing after another approach to American history, and instead focus on what we call key historical processes, on the impacts of conquest and colonialism, the creation, growth, and endurance of diverse multicultural communities over time, uh, and the critical and contested relevance of telling stories about these pasts in the present. And of course, we worked on how to convey all of this to 10-year-olds in classrooms that could contain up to a dozen different first languages. It was what one teacher actually started calling the Can You Say Ethnogenesis curriculum. <laughs> Perhaps most importantly of all, we strove to demonstrate to these teachers that they could teach about these historical processes using places and resources and stories that were present right here in their own Western communities. Because it turns out, those historical processes were not limited to the East Coast and to the 18th century. Yes, we did take them to Boston, but we also took them to Monterey and to Fort Ross and to their local history museum. Because the reality was that for most of the teachers that we worked with, and for the overwhelming majority of their students, Boston might as well be Bora Bora. Speaking of the Pacific. <laughs> In our last trip east together, of the 30-some teachers who attended, five had been out of the state of California before. One had been to the East Coast before. So does the West feel like an edge to many of the people who live in it today? Well, yes. Especially when historically juxtaposed to a place that is perceived as another opposite and often oppositional edge called the East. The challenge became for us how to talk about big sweeping global processes like colonialism but still acknowledge and explore those regional differences of peoples and times and cultures and environments and power regimes and so on. So how did including archaeology and an archaeological perspective help with that meet this challenge? That turned out to be a really interesting question. In fact, we almost lost the archaeologist on the team in the second grant cycle. When one reviewer objected to, and I quote, the sheer irrelevance of including me. <laughs> After all, they objected. What does archaeology have to do with American history? Which became something of a rallying cry for our whole program after that. So we did all the things you would normally do um, with archaeology and K-12 classrooms. We had units on the archaeology of Jamestown and from the plantation. Perhaps one of the most popular ones was a unit on the archaeology of parting ways that the teachers designed themselves to be used to commemorate Veterans Day every year, which was pretty awesome. Uh, and during our summer trips, colleagues in the local destinations like Ruben Mendoza in Monterey and Patty Jackson and Jed Levin from Philadelphia contributed hours and hours of their time to bring their diverse archaeological projects alive, always to rave reviews from the teachers. But I would argue that in the end, what archaeology brought to the table and to the classroom in this case, were the concepts and the basic working vocabulary that let the teachers bring these stories home to their own students. To extend the idea of an American history to the West, not just as a late in the day add on something that happened in the last week of May, if you were lucky. Um, a residual set of chapters at the end of the textbook that never quite got read. But as a place, or as many places, where the same historical processes took place, the same colonial encounters occurred with the same world-altering consequences, the same kinds of new communities were created, the same kinds of contests over freedom and suffrage and justice were fought out. And perhaps most importantly for the people who participated in our workshops and told us about the effects on their classrooms, 
the same kinds of legacies of these historical processes still unfold today and are incorporated into today's ongoing making of the West as a place. Always its own defined region, always integrally related to larger domains. This is not an archaeology done in the West or even of the West. This is an archaeology from the West. And this is perhaps where historical archaeologists working in the West can and will take all of us next.